Welcome to the Digital Agency Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Englander. So my big announcement for you today is that my book, Relationship Sales at Scale, is available for pre-order and it comes out on June 13th in a few weeks. And to read you the official blurb, here it is. In a world of noise, competition, and skepticism, spamming your prospects with undifferentiated pitches, case studies, and sales collateral is like yelling at a brick wall. On the other hand, going old school and trying to personalize every touchpoint 100% is unrealistic and unsustainable. The few people you manage to contact might not notice or care, and when life gets busy, your sales activity grinds to a halt and your pipeline runs dry. So what if the answer is combining the new school with the old? Instead of going in cold, how much faster would you grow if you could identify and open doors with the prospects who live within your circles of influence and are already primed to trust and do business with you? Relationship sales at scale is the new selling philosophy for our age. It marries the timeless power of tribe-based trust with digitally enabled scale so that you can open doors tastefully and convert prospects consistently, all without spamming anyone. So again, it's written by me, Dan Englander. I'm the CEO and founder of this company, Sales Schema, and the book's stories, strategies, and hands-on resources are grounded in thousands of outreach campaigns conducted since 2014 among almost 90 organizations, mostly in the agency, B2B, and professional service spaces, all designed to secure opportunities between clients and hard-to-reach prospects, including the leaders of some of the biggest companies on earth. A few things that you will know by the end of this book, you're going to learn how to balance personalization and scale to keep your pipeline full and achieve reliable and predictable growth. You're going to learn how to condense five years of networking into a single week-long campaign so you can batch up warm referrals into specific ideal accounts. You're going to learn how to de-risk conversations with highly skeptical prospects by leveraging strong personal commonalities instead of boring publicly available information like saying, hey, I saw you tweeted about this thing. That's cool. You're going to learn how to divide up prospecting and sales duties so that you can avoid burnout, even if your team is small or even if it's just you. You're going to learn how to leverage dozens of actual copy examples, campaign strategies, and get access to online resources so that you can launch and close deals in a matter of weeks and much, much more. Relationship Sales at Scale is going to reshape the way you think about new business overall and is going to give you the tools and strategies to scale reliably whether you are an owner, a dedicated salesperson, or in any growth-focused role, even if it's a hybrid one. So if you'd like to learn more about the book, check out the resources in it, or if you're ready, pre-order it ahead of the June 13th launch. You can do that by going to saleschema.com slash rsas. Again, that's saleschema.com slash rsas. Noel, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, no worries, Dan. Good to be here. Yeah, uh, so so much to dig into, and we were we were sort of talking before I threw on the recorder, and you're getting into having the biggest month ever. So I will backtrack and get into your background, but let's start there. Like, why are you having the biggest month ever? How, how did that come to be? Yeah, so uh, we've spent a long time doing all kinds of weird and wonderful things, and uh, being helpful and friendly, I, I've discovered, is actually a perfectly valid strategy. Almost sounds too simple, but it's working really well for us. And yeah, like I mentioned, had a uh, biggest month ever in uh, April, just gone, uh, which was great. And crucially, it was the first month where I just thought to myself, yeah, you know what? I did this and we've done this. And this is happening because of things we did. We had a really, really good month, a couple of months ago in January. And I was full of that kind of entrepreneur's excuses and like disclaimers for why, like kind of, oh, maybe it was a seasonal peak or it was a bit of a fluke. All the kind of things, probably just to give me comfort, just in case it didn't happen again. And so, yeah, happening like, you know, kind of a good number for us is, uh, you know, kind of having a second time. It's an exciting moment to go, yeah, okay, this is this is real now. We're, uh, we're doing the right thing. Yeah, which is a really interesting kind of like meta point about how do you give yourself credit without giving yourself, without, you know, ignoring the sort of forces that are outside of all of our control, right? So can you talk about that a bit? Like what what did you do to get this peak and why do you think it, it's, it's different than the possible external forces that we all like to, to point to, right? So the, there's two key things that I've done. One is uh, and the kind of thing that's actually kind of driven the sales is we've asked for referrals. So we've always got 
organic referrals people recommend us we pride ourselves on like doing a really really good job and being really helpful and friendly and quite personal with the service we give and so people like that naturally and then they recommend us to friends and other business owners which is great but i've never pursued kind of actually actively trying to kind of provoke referrals and so at the start of the year i started being much more intentional about it and just just saying to people hey you know you know do you know a couple of business owners just like you that you could introduce me to you know there's no hard sell there's no pitch but just I'd just like to have some more conversation and people have responded really really well to that and we now inject that typically three times into our process and, and what i was taught was that you should ask for referrals three times once right away at the point of purchase then a second time just after you've kind of the point of value creation like kind of the wow moment and then the third time kind of after you've finished kind of working with them and that varies a little bit depending on the project the engagement things like that but yeah, just asking people for referrals. And if people are happy with what you do, then they're generally pretty happy to kind of introduce you. And also phrasing it as an introduction, not a referral, that makes a big difference. It's just a, hey, can you introduce me to anyone? We'll have a chat and we'll see what happens from there. Yeah, I, I really like that. I've never thought about that, the phrasing as much, but that that probably does make a difference. These little things do, do make big differences. And, and can you talk about, just to dig into that a little bit more, like what, what system are you using? Is that you kind of being point of contact with the client? You have a team that's doing that. You know, if you do have a team, are they incentivized? I'd love to just learn, learn more about that. Yeah, right now it's me, myself, and I. So it's very, very manual. So we have within our process, we have certain trigger points where Asana tasks get triggered to me to kind of follow up. I do a lot of Bonjoro videos, which are hyper personal videos. And I talk a lot about hard things that don't scale. So Bonjoro is this, this great little tool that can tie in with your CRM system. It can tie in with Zapier and Stripe and things like that. And what it is, it's this, is an app that you have a to-do list of people to shoot a quick video to. And you do a super simple uh, template and you shoot a little video on your phone and ping, off it goes. And they get a little, they get an email, they get a little gif in the email. So if you wave for the first like two seconds of the, um, of the video then that's what they see in their inbox and it's the more casual i do them the better people like them and i do a lot of those uh, and it can it, like i said links in with zapier so for instance when we get a purchase stripe triggers zapier which triggers bonjoro which gives me a prompt to do a, a bonjoro video and normally within 24 hours or so i try and do a little video just to say hey thanks so much for purchasing and, and welcome to job rack and and i will then say hey you know one of the things that's really important to us uh, is referrals so you know do you know anyone just like you that you know you could mention job rep too and that could potentially have an introduction and so yeah it's using kind of bits of technology like that to help me but then it's very very manual right now at least yeah and what i really like about that and i think that you know it sounds like you have a much more productized service than some of our listeners in the job hosting space but i, th I still think there's like a really strong takeaway that i'm already thinking about in our organization even if you have more of like a white glove hands-on service which is that you know you want to be building that relationship with with a client especially like a new client but there's always a cost if you have to get them to invest time on a call or filling out a form or, or whatever so this is a way to kind of have your team take care of that and like start building that relationship without asking anybody to invest a lot of time. So I, I, I'm definitely taking notes on, on that sort of thing. Let's back up entirely. And I, I will have talked about a little bit about your intro, you know, before we set up the show, but can you talk about your backgrounds and job rack EU and all those good things? Yeah, sure thing. So I know obviously I'm based here in London. I've got a kind of mild addiction to rooftop bars. Uh, which is we're coming into spring and summer we've got some blue skies and sunshine it's, it's a good time to uh, kind of uh, start kind of perusing those again i've got a background in kind of corporate technology leadership so it director type roles and um i bought job rack where are we three and a half years ago now it was uh, a very small job board at that point focused entirely on eastern europe and that that is and will remain our our focus so what we do is we help business owners and especially agency owners from all over the world hire really, really high quality team members from Eastern Europe. And uh, we've expanded out into hiring services. So having a business that conventional job board is money while you sleep. It's a beautiful business model, but hard to scale because, you know, people aren't paying an awful lot. Therefore, you can't invest an awful lot in marketing. So we expanded out into hiring services. Lots and lots of people were finding that hiring is hard and they wanted help. And we were in a good place to help with that. And yeah, becoming a, effectively an agency and a recruitment agency and you know, hiring services is what's really kind of driving our growth and, and driving a lot of success, you know, as well as the job board, which still exists and does well, 
Um, but yeah, they're kind of the very much the kind of more white glove services is what's powering our growth. Yeah, thanks for that. And that, that sparked a lot, a lot of questions on my end. So first to give, to give everybody a little bit, little bit of context, I was familiar with Job Rack because you and I are both in a group that's really great called Dynamite Circle, which is an entrepreneur's networking group. It was the first group that I ever got in when I started a business. And it, it always was the location independent kind of like piratey, you know, bootstrapped entrepreneurs group run by, by Dan Andrews and Ian Schoen. And they, they also host the Tropical MBA podcast. And I remember when I first started Sales Schema around the early years, flying off to Bangkok because they'd have their annual flagship conference. I, I'm, I'm blanking on the, the former owner or CEO of Job Rack, but I know that I, I encountered him or met him briefly, maybe. And it, was, it was always been such a good group. And that's how we met. So to go back to whenever you bought it, can you talk about that? Like why, how did you identify Job Rack as a good, good acquisition? How, how did that come about? Why did you decide to buy this company? Yeah, sure. So I had, like I said, I had kind of a, a very corporate background. And I've been doing a lot of kind of hiring and firing and, and leading of uh, large teams for, for a lot of time. About a year before I bought, before I bought JobRack, I had took a basically kind of year out of the corporate world and I launched and tried to scale an interview coaching business. So helping candidates to kind of perform better interviews. Struggled with the kind of the scalability of that, certainly here in the UK. And so I was just heading back into the corporate world for a kind of a contract, a consulting kind of gig. And I was looking for something to kind of either buy into or to start up. And I spent this time, I was helping a lot of people hire. I had used JobRack to help some other people hire with like a consulting basis. And then there was a post on the forum, on the Dynamite Circle forum, um, saying that it was either going to be shut down if it wasn't sold. It had been kind of mothballed for about a year uh, by the former owners. So Matt and Neil originally started it. It was born in a, in a forum post, in fact, in the, in the DC forum. And they'd started it, they'd run it, they'd built it up. Um, Matt had kind of gone a separate way and then Neil and a guy called Stephen were running it. And um, yeah, it kind of really, they had a much bigger kind of thing. Their main gig was much, much bigger. This was a side project and um, yeah, it was either time to shut it down or sell it. And it was just serendipity. Uh, it really, really was. I had the perfect background for it. It already existed. The tech had been written. They had a bit of a brand and a bit of a database there. And, you know, it was doing $15 a month in revenue, right? One five. So the purchase price wasn't crazy. However, when we talk about multiples and multiples of profit, I think I bought it for a multiple of infinity, um, which is interesting against most stats. However, I have now 4,000 X the revenue, which is a lovely vanity metric and a lot of fun to talk about. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's really interesting. And what, so, so it's been how long? About three or four years? Three and a half years. Yeah, yeah so up four years in October. Got it. So you're jumping into the seat, kind of running a job board. And so this would have been 26, 28, 18 or something. 18. Yeah, 2018. 18, yeah. What what did you do, you know, from in those intervening years to grow it? Like, what are some of the, the approaches you've taken? Because and to dig into that a little bit more, I'm always impressed by people running marketplaces because there's always that that catch 22 where you need sellers to get buyers and buyers to get sellers. So it's I think a lot of the times people walk into these businesses without like realizing how hard they are and it, and it takes a long time to get them off the ground. So I'd love to hear, and it sounds like you've gotten some serious momentum now. So I'd lo love to understand kind of how you've scaled this business in the last few years. Yeah, sure. So the first two years, uh, it, it was very kind of straightforward and it, it didn't kind of grow that much, so relatively. So well, I, first thing I did was I hired someone from Eastern Europe to kind of just help kind of, they were just a really, really good jack of all trades kind of virtual assistant. So they were doing kind of job seeker support, a little bit of employer support, we put the prices up from $1. Uh, $1 a job post wasn't going to make me uh, rich anytime soon. So we, uh, we put that up to a sensible point, uh, did a Black Friday deal just about three weeks after I bought the site, and then very quickly just kind of gained some traction within you know, the Dynamite Circle community and then started kind of getting out of there. It was, you know, I was kind of working a full-time job at the same time. And so it kind of just grew quite slowly. And it was, you know, we got up within about three or four months, we got up to doing a few thousand dollars a month. So it was kind of profitable, uh, but all the money I was planning back into the site. And that kind of continued for a couple of years. I tried a whole bunch of different experiments. I invested a bunch of money into it. We tried Facebook ads, webinar funnels, all kinds of different things. But one of the tricky things is, is you know, you've got to kind of have some serious cash to throw at it to, you know, you're going up. If you want to do Google ads, for instance, right, you're up against Fiverr, you're up against Indeed and TopTal and people like that with some pretty deep pockets. And ultimately, you're only charging, you know, we're charged now $199 for a job post. So, you know, it's not kind of huge sums. 
So that kind of took us kind of two years or so. And then mid 2020, I was getting a lot of people that were coming to me saying, look, hiring's hard and we want some help to hire. They still wanted to interview themselves, but they just couldn't find, you know, a lot of the times the right talent and A players, especially, are not hanging out on job boards. You have to kind of hunt them out, especially right now with kind of software developers. And so that kind of just prompted some seeds in my mind saying, OK, is there a way to do a like a halfway house between a DIY job post and a full done for you model, which is very, very time intensive. And um, yeah, we came up with a done with you service, launched that at the very back end of 2020. Uh, so just coming up to 18 months now. And that's been that's been huge. Instantly, you know, we did two roles in the first month just from me talking to people eight roles in the second month and then it's grown from there and we're doing kind of bet typically between 20 and 30 roles a month with our kind of done with you service and that very very kind of hands-on very helpful and friendly with our clients and just finding really, really good people and you know the key thing there is i've built my team so if we go back to december 2020 i had one full-time team member and some freelancers i've now got 15 permanent team members and 12 of them are full-time so the team has changed a lot and I think we've tripled in the last four months alone, um, which uh, thankfully we're very good at hiring, but uh, that does bring, bring challenges if when, you, when we scale that quick. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. And, and one thing that comes to mind and is kind of a phenomenon that, that I've observed a lot recently is this shift from software products becoming more service pro service offerings. And we've seen it all over the place. I think we're we're kind of doing it the reverse order. We're, we're a service business that's adopting more of like a software core, I guess, over the next year or so. Uh, but aside from that, you know, I think we had Marcel Petapoff and Parakito on the show talking about going from financial or bookkeeping service, uh, software product, decoupling that, adding the service element. So, and this, this seems kind of like, like another example of that. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Do you think that phenomenon is real and, you know, and that actually is occurring? And if so, why do you think it's happening? I think, yeah, I definitely do. I think there is so much software out there, right? And I have to sit on my hands sometimes. Every time I see someone recommend some cool new shiny thing and I get tempted, I'll go to the site and I'll have my finger over the trial button. And then it's like, was this already on my list? No, right, leave it the hell alone. I don't need another distraction. Yeah. So, and I, I think more and more there is, you know, generally the things that we're looking to do, oftentimes they're actually pretty hard. And so if you can get help with doing them, and some of this for me comes down to like, what do I want to be good at? What does an agency owner or a business owner or any of their team members, what should they be good at? Generally, there's not many business owners that are doing their own accounting or they're doing their own bookkeeping, right? Because they, they recognize that's not worth them becoming a specialist in. Seeing the same with hiring. We see the same with SEO. We see the same with all kinds of different services that um, you can get specialist help. And especially now that it doesn't need to be exorbitantly expensive to get that help when you need it. Um, that's making a real difference. And so I think it's about business owners figuring out, right, what do they really want to want to be good at and what do they enjoy doing and then getting help from, from there. And I think where there's been lots and lots of SaaS and there's still great SaaS out there, there is, I think it was actually Matt Newton who um, was the, you know, kind of one of the co-founders of, of JobRack. In our community, at least, he was one of the first people to use the kind of term SWAS, software with a service. And so that not only have you got a great piece of, piece of tech, piece of software, but you actually get the help to use it so that you do actually use it and get the benefits from it, as opposed to it being another tool hitting the credit card every month that you're not getting the most out of. Yeah, that's that That makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to try to stick the landing on this question. I'm not sure that I will because I got a lot flow, flowing around in my head right now. One is this idea of, okay, so you're you're going after, let's say, high level dev talent, right? And it's, and you, yeah, I think you mentioned earlier, if I understand right, a lot of this talent aren't just clicking and saying, hey, I'm over here. If you want to hire me, you've got to go hit them up and say, hey, come over here, check this out. You know, are you interested and sort of act like a recruiter? So on one hand, like people hiring whatever six figure dev talent, or maybe it's less in Eastern Europe, and we'll talk about that. They're price anchored at a formal recruiter, right? That there might be spending 10% or whatever it is per year, like serious coin to get this person. And then on the other side, they have a job board where there's paying like a subscription fee of like 50, 100, 200 a month or something like that. So how, do, I guess the question is like, how do you maintain the value of really what you're doing, which is essentially like a recruiting service to get this person while making this sustainable profitably and everything like that, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So when I launched the service originally, we launched it a thousand dollars. 
Uh, the first few rolls we did were a thousand bucks, which if I look back, that was like the steal of a century for the first few people that signed up with us. But it was a, you know, it's a one-off price. So there's no ongoing payments, which makes it very easy to amend the pricing. Um, but also we were proving it and we were, we were trying that. And we've been in kind of growth phase and still are really, but we're in growth phase for the last 18 months. We're just actually doing a price increase right now. And some of that is because I want to keep investing in the service. So we're just onboarding a dedicated customer success manager, for instance. We are bringing in technical sources um, so that we can do technical screening interviews. So we're, we're constantly making the service better and adding more into it to, to make the process better. In terms of that, that bit, yeah, I mean, we're, we're always going to be a long way away from conventional recruiters in terms of pricing because either they do 10, I mean, 10 percent cheap. Generally, it's 15, 20 or even 25 percent of kind of annual package, which is, a, you know, if you're hiring in the US, it's a huge sum of money. If even if we're regardless where you're hiring, it's still a lot of money. And it's not always like kind of balanced with the effort that it takes. You know, hiring is hard. Finding really good people is hard. Personally, I'm not a fan of the, the kind of the commission based model because I'd much rather be you know, a, be a balance between value based pricing and also cost as well. So, you know, have an Eastern European team. We are very, very good at what we do and we're kind of we're working to be very efficient. And so, you know, I can pass some of those savings on to to our clients and also with it being a done with you service that the client still has some involvement or the business owner still has an involvement that lets us be just more efficient with the process as opposed to kind of going all the way through the process, doing all the effort and then fingers crossed that, you know, we nailed it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, and I guess with that, to give a little context, can you talk about your process of finding that talent? You know, like if, if a client comes in and they're like, I'm looking for this sort of person and you, and you don't have to give away anything you don't want to, but how are you actually going out to, to get people to apply and to, you know, on the supply side, basically? Yeah, so we have 32 as of today, 32 different sources that we go to for talent. Um, we have the obvious ones, uh, LinkedIn. We still do a little bit through LinkedIn. We have some more unusual ones. So if it's developers, we do technical sourcing through GitHub, for example. We've got some methods that we use there. We are in a whole range of private Slack communities, Facebook groups, very, very specific places that people in Eastern Europe hang out of the various different skills. And so, you know, we've got this, effectively, it's a spreadsheet a Google sheet of where, you know, by the type of role that tells us where we go to look at it and that we're constantly, we've built that up. How do we go and find the right talent? And then it's just, you know, having the right people going out and scouring and looking for them. Plus, as we build our network, as we build our social following in our database in Eastern Europe, that kind of gets, in a sense, gets easier over time. But at the same time, it's, you know, there's so much movement. We're constantly hunting for more people. Like you said, two-sided marketplace, you have two different customers with two very, very different kind of needs and wants. So the ultimate answer is lots and lots of very manual effort and a really, really good team. Yeah, that makes sense. And what, I mean, I guess the, the difficult thing I think with hiring is that it's like, it's, it's so, so important to get right. The cost of getting it wrong is so high. How do you decide what you do and what you don't do, right? Because a recruiter is saying like, I'm actually going to place this person. A lot of them have deals where it's like, if they quit or you fire them, then six months, a year, you get a portion back. Like, there's always de-risks. How do you draw the line over like how far you're going to take things? And let's say that's as part of a, the, the, your highest end service, you know, the thing where you're doing the most, but you're doing less than a recruiter would do. Like, where, where is that demarcation? Yeah. It moves, if I'm honest, uh, and it kind of because we are actually if I think back to what we were doing when we launched the done with you service, like, you know, 18 months ago, it was vastly less than we're doing now. You know, we now do screening interviews with every candidate and we're jumping on a video call with them. We record those calls. We're asking very specific questions. Um, we've got better tooling in place. So it does move. And some of that is I have to just every now and again, just look at what we are doing and saying, okay, should we be doing this? Are we pricing this into the service? But ultimately, what we do is should be, for me, is driven by how can we make our business owner clients happy? And how can we give them just an amazing service that delivers a coach of mine, uh, Austin Netsley, refers to it as raving fans, right? How can we get raving fans? And for me and for the entire team, it's all about the long term. Yes, I like high, helping someone hire one hire, but actually it's much more about the very, very long term view. Same as any agency owner, right? much easier to keep existing clients than it is to get new ones so really you know we very regularly go what many people say is above and beyond because we can 
and we enjoy it and it gets great results and then people talk about us and then we get referrals and then it, it just keeps this kind of virtuous circle going around and and every now and again we'll look at it and go hang on a minute that thing we're doing does that make sense is it adding value and there's been a couple of things we've removed because they've not been making a real significant difference and then every now and again someone will ask us something and we're like yeah yeah we can do that we'll we'll add that in yeah makes sense and, and to kind of get to the situation you know on the ground there's this hiring squeeze that i'm sure is a whole news at this point uh, i'm gonna ask you a very very simple easy question why is it happening explain all of it <laughs> so that's an easy question with uh, some interesting answers and lots of, I mean, and again, some of this is just my pure opinion. I, I think there's a couple of things. So one is obviously we've had a pandemic for the last couple of years and that has woken people up in a lot of ways to A, new ways of working, B, to the fact that life is short and toiling away for 16 hours a day with a one hour commute, you know, hours of commuting each week, et cetera. Maybe that's not entirely what they want to do with their life. So I think what we've seen is people kind of go and hang on a minute, there's a, there's a different way to work and maybe I want to do something different. And that's, that's driven, you know, what many people call this, this kind of mass resignation. At the same time, we're seeing this sense of entitlement amongst certainly, you know, maybe the generation uh, kind of beneath you and me, Dan, that, the, you know, we've got kind of junior developers coming in in the US that looking for six figure salaries as their starting salary, which is frankly insane in my humble opinion, right? However, that's really good for me for business, right? Because not many people in the US want to pay 100 grand to a brand new developer with fundamentally no skills, especially when they don't need to and they can get better people elsewhere. So I think there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. I think there's a different or a completely different sense of entitlement uh, with a lot of people in the workforce coming through in the Western world. So UK, US, Canada, Australia, you know, Western Europe, et cetera. Not the case uh, elsewhere in the world. I think we are seeing just people kind of prioritizing life a little bit more than work and looking for kind of some different things. And people are a bit less hungry, I think. I think people have got used to, you know, not having to work that hard and, you know, just expecting things that maybe aren't quite in line with you know, what's reasonable. Yeah, and we're and I'm I'm obviously not super versed in all, all the macroeconomics and everything playing into this. And then there's inflation, you know, so so I'm sure that this has been explained uh, better elsewhere. But I'm always curious about how does that trickle up, right? So if you have the shock at the bottom, okay, I get it. Nobody wants to go back to their their crappy job, but like a, you know, a dev job, even one that's paying ninety k starting, is still like a pretty compelling and interesting job. So I'm I'm, I'm always curious, like how the shock to the system the mechanics of it or the dynamics like how does that go up right yeah it's really really interesting and i think i think it kind of goes all ways so you get a situation where you know let's say in the us kind of thing let's take in the us as an example we get people that don't want to work for a certain way and then agency owners especially look and say well i can't afford to pay 100 grand for a developer for of you know junior developer funding so then they look and they say well what are my options and then they say okay well i could use another agency or i can hire elsewhere in the world and then, you know, I get a lot of people that come to me initially because they've heard that Eastern Europe is a better value area of the world to hire from, which it absolutely is. And that's where the conversation starts. Then they see some candidates and then maybe they hire their first person and then they come back and they stay hiring from Eastern Europe because of the quality. And it's not, you know, some areas of the world you can hire cheaper, but the quality is maybe a little bit below what you're used to. And then there's other areas of the world and Eastern Europe's one of them where you hire, you can get better value and get equivalent or better quality as well and that can be a little bit startling to people at first and then pretty exciting because if you're a business owner and you can scale faster help more clients yourself and grow your business by hiring two people instead of one for the same money then it kind of starts getting pretty exciting what that then means for the junior developers that are looking for 100k, 100k a year that can't all go and work at google and netflix hmm then at some stage they might have to kind of revise what they're asking for but you know it's uh you know, there's a big shortage of developers in the US and there's a lot of businesses that still want to stay hiring locally and have people come into an office. So even for those junior six figure expectation developers, there's still lots of opportunity. Yeah. And it's like we we just hired a client success manager or account manager, kind of similar role. And then we're in the process of hiring a salesperson and both roles, you know, we, we finally got somebody good, but the the, the top of the funnel, you know, the well was, was way smaller than in previous hiring rounds. And I'm, I'm always thinking like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not tuning our own horn or anything, but I'm like, this is pretty market rate paying, you know, uh, remote job. Like this is like not working at a, 
at a, at a restaurant or, you know, or like a boring come into the office kind of thing. And still it's, it's hard to find people. So I'm always just wondering like, where, where are all, all these uh, Zoomers or whatever? Like, what, what are they doing? Are they all starting companies? Are they like all just working for Google? Like, what, are they just hiding under their bed and collecting uh, the, the, the government checks still? Like what's going on? I, I think it's a great question. I do not know. I do not know. I think there's a, you know, if we look at the number of people kind of starting up their own thing, um and you know whether they're freelancing whatever it is that they're doing it just means they're up i think it feels like there's less people looking for a permanent job in that sense i think that might swing around right I, there's so many people get into what they refer to as entrepreneurship right and then if i think i can't remember the stat it's like tens of thousands of businesses that fail every day because let's be clear what what we're doing is hard right it is not easy and you know even in our community from time to time there are people that go back to having a job because actually you can get really interesting jobs and you can have a really lovely time doing really interesting work, knowing you're getting paid, you're getting healthcare, all those good things. So I think, yes, right now there's a lot of people piling into entrepreneurship and, you know, going to try and make it work at some stage, a good number of those will go back into the job market. Yeah. That's a fair, fair hypothesis. Uh, you talked about Eastern Europe a little bit and, and, you know, we see all sorts of ways the companies niche and I've always found the, the geographic talent one to be kind of interesting. So I, I know that you bought the company, they're already focused on Eastern Europe, but can you talk about that as a niche, as opposed to Latin America or India or Philippines, or we only hire dev talent, you know, you do it by, by focus. So I'd love, love to hear your thoughts on that and why, and why the company focused on Eastern Europe. Yeah, so very originally when the company started, it was a forum thread and lots of people were having difficulty hiring about software developers. This is back in 2015. And Matt and Neil uh, both independently actually were posting about, hey, we found these really, really great software developers in Eastern Europe. It's just like this untapped market of incredible talent. And that, you know, it grew from there, it grew from this. This was just a particular sweet spot. They'd had experience in it. And they just built it you know, using Eastern European talent to build the platform and then to kind of start and grow from there. And I liked the fact that it was niche down, right? So one of my kind of challenges historically, especially when I did the interview coaching business was that I wasn't niche far enough down. And then you're trying to market to everybody. And that's, that's really, really difficult. I have been tempted to niche down further. So there's been a couple of times I've looked at it and said, hmm, should I niche down in that we only hire Eastern European software developers? You know, that's, that's one option. But it would felt like I would be a leaving money on the table, but be also not, you know, kind of missing an opportunity to really help business owners to hire. Because if I was to niche down into, you know, Eastern European software developers, well, who's going to do Eastern European virtual assistants or Eastern European operations managers? And so for me so far, it's a no brainer to actually cover everything, all the roles that we do. And we have just a couple of limits and areas that we don't play in, but you know, we cover most roles from Eastern Europe, and that's what we're that's what we're good at. Other areas of the world, and I'm the first to say, you can hire amazing remote talent from anywhere in the world. There are regions of the world that have pros and cons depending on where you are, what you need, the attitude, energy, culture, etc. That you need, and it's just about mapping your needs with the right area of the world for you and for that particular role. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, and I'd love to hear, so we talked about the hiring shock and kind of how it's playing out, you know, in the West, at least in the US. I'd love to hear what, what's life like in Eastern Europe? Like what countries are you employing from? What's the archetype for your dev talent or the other people? Like what's their day-to-day -day like? I'd love to just understand how things are playing out over there. Yeah, so we cover 22 countries in total. And that includes everything that we could vaguely associate as being Eastern Europe. Uh, and a little bit into Central Europe. However, I would say 90% of our uh, job seekers and our kind of successful candidates are coming from probably about six or seven countries. So typically around the Balkans region. So this is Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Macedonia, Albania, Croatia, and then maybe kind of Bulgaria and Romania as well. And that's definitely probably like 90% of our candidates. The reason for that is because we get all of the benefits of the, you know, the Eastern European kind of stereotype, which is really hard working, great infrastructure, there's no extreme weather, great education and skills, all those kind of good things, mapped with good, like kind of great kind of value in that sense. You know, they've got a lower cost of living. Any of the countries that have skirted or even are in the EU tend to have you know, very, very significant cost of living increases that translates into, into salary increases. So the countries that we focus on tend to have that, that kind of that kind of sweet spot for kind of for business owners. 
And it translates into, you know, we're all about, you know, paying very, very fair wages for the people where they are. And they're appreciating it because they're getting to live a better life. A lot of the time, the conditions to work for local businesses in these areas is not great. Um, and the salaries tend to be tend to be very, very low. So, yeah, that's that's where we tend to focus. And for our remote workers, you know, our we're just kind of launching a bit of a new tagline for the job seekers. And it's, you know, we're all about serious remote jobs for serious remote workers. There's lots of platforms out there that are pitching, uh, hey, you can work from the beach, you can work from the car, you can work from anywhere. I don't know any business owners that want to hire a remote worker that is happy with that, right? We're about, there's a bit of a misnomer and a misunderstanding sometimes about what is remote work. It doesn't mean you can work whenever you want. It doesn't mean, you know, you can do an hour here and maybe two hours later on, things like that. Most of our employees are happy with asynchronous work but I'm kind of broadly looking for someone to work eight hours a day if it's full time, normally in, you know, in a normal kind of working day type environment, but there's a bit of flexibility here and there. So, you know, my team, they are at their desks for a normal working day. They take breaks, et cetera. We have a really, really great time and they love being part of our team, but it's a serious job. It's not kind of, oh, I'm going to do a bit here and then I'm going to, you know, kind of chillax for kind of two hours. And so, for, yeah, that's our focus is kind of people that want to have a serious job that they can progress in, do really well, have a great time with it, kind of a great team, um, but, you know, commit and, and work hard. Yeah, I, I really like that point because that, that's bigger than just outsour- the outsourced talent world. You know, I think that was something that was that was overpromised or just kind of this illusion of like, I'm just going to work on a beach whenever I want, you know, whether you're running a company or you're an employee, like there's very few roles or jobs that can actually be done that way unless you are just an investor, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. that. And, and you need a really matte laptop screen as well, right? Because the reflection from the sun when you're on the beach is just a nightmare. Yeah, ex- exactly. Some good sunglasses and everything like that. And I've definitely been there, uh, done that. So no, one, one random question that I, I, I'm on podcast and I feel like I, we haven't done a good enough job with these kind of like lightning round questions about, you know, what are you reading? What tools are you using and stuff? And they, I think they are pretty cool. So you're going to be the inaugural guest for these questions. So it's okay if uh, you, you you butcher them as I have on podcasts. But can you talk about a book? Like what, do you, what are you reading these days, if anything? So I'm reading a bunch of different things at the moment. Most impactful book for me recently is called The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker. And they, I highly recommend this to absolutely everyone. It's all about how to have a better gathering, right? Whether it's a party, whether it's a dinner, whether it's a business meeting. And I'm really big on this. I'm really big on having better conversations with people. And the principle being is that, you know, you might have a party and you put loads of effort into the food, the drink, maybe the decorations, but you put no effort into actually making sure people have a good conversation. And it's a fascinating book. She is a gathering consultant, effectively, everything from UN peace treaty type kind of gatherings to you know company retreats so highly recommend that it's a really really great book i'm also just starting to listen and read a couple of books from kind of people that uh, i'm looking to partner with so key person of influence from daniel Priestley, and also jody grundon's book all about digital numbers and so uh, yeah working through some of those so that's just kind of people that i'm now speaking to kind of partnering with and working with they're the kind of main things. And then the thing that kind of helps me get to sleep at night just to help my brain switch off normally involves fighter jets, special forces, yeah. something like that. ML Buchanan is, is a recent one that I've just been absolutely binge reading. Um, it's about a uh, autistic air crash investigator and they're really, really well written and just fast paced action. And it's just that that's what kind of sends me to sleep at night. Yeah, yeah, I like that stuff too. Um, Daniel Priestley, I, I loved Oversubscribe. That's the only one I've read from yeah. him, but it's a great yeah. book. Noel, and then the last question is just kind of like, uh, what what are you up to next? Like, what's the what's the next big project over the horizon, et cetera? Yeah, so the, the tough thing that I'm working on right now is delegation. So I want to be much, much, much better at delegating. I've got a really great EA and virtual office manager of my own. Uh, I've got an ops manager in place. I've got like a head of recruitment. And then the next stage is to bring in, you know, what we're referring to as a hiring strategist. So someone to take over some of the client calls from me, our kind of client consultation calls. And people would typically refer them to as the sales calls, but they're not really sales calls. It's much more about us actually just helping people figure out what they need. If it's a fit, if we can help them hire, then, you know, we'll talk them through that. That's going to be a tough one, right? Because I very much in the face of the business. And finding a way to free up a little bit of my time. I'd like to be slightly less owned by my calendar. 
um, but still I want to keep this very kind of helpful and friendly and, and kind of personal approach that we've got. So that's my next next big challenge this quarter. Yeah, and I'll just go ahead and sell your service a little bit. So that's a scarcity thing because right now if you go to Job Rack, you can actually book a call with Noel directly on the site. So I recommend everybody listening <laughs> take advantage of that while it's still there, right? Because that's that's not common for you to be able to talk to the CEO from a couple clicks. So go ahead and take advantage yeah. of that. See if Job Rack can help out. Um, Beyond that plug, Bill, how can people get in touch with you? Is there anywhere else you know you want people to go? Yeah, simply head to, I mean, kind of for most of your listeners, jobrack.eu slash agency is going to be the best link. And that kind of just gives you a good kind of understanding about kind of how we help agencies and kind of some of the opportunities for you. And um, yeah, as you said, Dan, they, uh, just a couple of clicks and you can book a call with me. And I'm always happy to chat, right? It doesn't matter whether you're looking to hire from Eastern Europe or not. Always have a chat, kind of give you some guidance, give you some help, understand what's going on with you and, you know, go from there. But just expect that I'm probably going to ask you for an introduction. Awesome. Makes sense. Noel, thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. No worries, Dan. Really great to chat.